Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, three degrees, 44 minutes south, 158 degrees, 13 minutes west. Wind fresh, sky fair. Remarks, departed Christmas Island after interruption of holiday plans. Reason for interruption, the 15th Lama and the wise guy from the east. The name Christmas was given to the island by its discoverer, Captain James Cook, who dropped the first civilized anchor off its west shore on Christmas Eve, 1777, celebrated the holiday, and left on the second day of the new year. We raised the outline of its palm groves just two days short of 170 years later and slipped into its sheltered lagoon to see what we could do to set the scene for our own celebration. There wasn't much we could arrange for a stateside, rotogravure-style Christmas scene. But with memories and the ache of homesickness to be fought by activity, the crewmen worked a change on the deck of the Scarlet Queen. An awning went up over number two holes. Wreath was spliced out of lengths of spare hawser. Hey, what do you think of this now, Captain? The Christmas tree materialized out of the shaft of an oar, to which were lashed branches from pandanus pines. By sunset, it was draped with light lines, some dipped in red paint, some in white. We were buried so deeply in the new Yuletide atmosphere that it was only by chance that my chief mate Gallagher lifted his head to see the stranger standing in through the reef paddock. Hey, Skipper, look at the liner bearing down on us. It wasn't quite a liner, but almost. It was a trim, luxurious power yacht, the Lurie, with a fortune in bright work shining in the setting sun. It nosed into Anchorage a few yards off our starboard beam, and a man in a white linen suit stepped to the boat deck rail. We'd almost forgotten Christmas until we heard the cry of a baby in one of his cabins, and then the hail. Ahoy, gentlemen! I trust you have brought the three emissaries from the Orient. Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Major Gregory Osgood, the MG and CB, the British usage uh, companion of the bar. Well, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is my chief officer, Mr. Gallagher. I'm glad to know you. My honor, sir. And you, Captain? Carney. Well, met, gentlemen. Indeed, a pleasant surprise to find you and your company here. Thanks. Come on in the cabin. I'd like to offer you some hospitality, Indeed, Major. Yes, I accept, Captain. That hail of yours about the three emissaries from the Orient threw us a little out of trim. <laughs> I should be surprised, sir, if it did not startle you. <laughs> Well, let us say it was a mere phrase, gentlemen, in the spirit of the season. And that was a baby we heard, wasn't it? Yes, it so happens that I do have a child aboard. Oh. Sit down, Major. Red? Oh, thank oh, you. Uh, yeah, I'll get it. Uh, he's a splendid, lusty little chap, Captain, of Cantonese extraction, a little more than a month in this world. A pathetic case, sir. Uh. Mm -hmm. According to the wish of the mother, I am transporting them to their homeland. Uh, thank you. Season's greeting to your boat. And to you, uh, Major. <laughs> No, uh, more pleasant <laughs> subjects, gentlemen. <laughs> if I might beg another portion of that uh, tasty spirit. Uh, sure, help yourself. <laughs> a friendly cup, gentlemen, from time immemorial. The cement of comradeship and the dispeller of loneliness. He cemented comradeship and dispelled loneliness right down to the bottom of the bottle before dark. And left after insisting that Gallagher and I have dinner with him aboard his yacht. <laughs> We put our dinghy over the side at about 6.30, stroked it across the few yards of water between the ships and climbed the polished accommodation ladder to the equally polished decks of the lorry. Well, uh, come in, gentlemen. Here, into the salon. You're in fine voice, Major. <laughs> yeah. 
We ought to have you for our song first. Uh, uh, it is a dismal croak, gentlemen. But could you hear the feeling behind it? <laughs> Here, this door. The first thing I noticed as we went in was the Chinese girl standing beside a box-like crib. She was quite beautiful. Her coloring delicate, her face less moon-shaped than the usual. Her whole physical attitude, the way she held herself, somehow a little non-oriental. She looked at us as though waiting, half fearfully, for us to start something. Uh, this gentleman is the mother, Shin Yang Sing. But the introduction must remain silent since the poor girl speaks no English. Well, that don't seem to be stopping the sprout here. Yeah, he sounds like he's got the makings of a good chief mate. <laughs> Merry little chap, is he not? Come, come, little fellow. Smile for your new friend. <laughs> Look at that, Chipper, with my finger. <laughs> he can hang on. Sure, he thinks it's a hat yet. I tell you, he's going to be a seaman. Hey, oh, 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 no, you don't. You aren't taking a bite off of that finger. <laughs> well, indeed, sir, there's no cause for fear. <laughs> hey, now then, gentlemen, I've seen two refreshments for, with which to whet your appetite. <laughs> hey, and then we shall see what beggarly fare will be set before us by my pantry men. <laughs> The Chinese girl was still standing there as we left. We didn't see her for the rest of the night. The cocktails were refreshing, the dinner was not beggarly, and the magazines we browsed through afterwards were recent. A little after ten, Red and I shoved off and rode back to the Queen. The sky was bright with moonlight and star film. The phosphorescence swirled off the blades of the oars. He's quite a host, Skipper. Yeah. Looks out quite a spread. Yeah. What's the matter? You sound like you got indigestion from it. I was just thinking it over, Red. I wonder why the hearty major is lying to us. Lying? Why should he? That's what I say. I don't know. Well, what makes you think he is? Magazine I ran across, Red. On child care. In English. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess it's their party. Come on, let's hit the sack. The next day brought more visitors to our lagoon. First, it was a trim, gaff-rigged schooner that stood in through the passage and dropped anchor just astern of the lorry. A few hours later, a lugger put her hook down off our stern. I hadn't realized that Christmas Island was so popular. But we had affairs of our own to keep our minds on. Just after sunset, Nielsen came into the cabin to bring me the latest development. Hey, could I have a word with you, Captain? Yeah, how are things going, Nielsen? Yeah, we're pretty good. We're, we're even getting some presents under the Christmas tree. And more of them were showing up every few minutes. A little early, aren't they? I thought they decided tomorrow would be the day for the presents. Well, that's what I come to talk to you about, Captain. With, huh? with all the work they did getting things rigged up and with those presents burning holes in their sea bags, they don't want to wait no longer. They, they get carried away and they want to have the party tonight. They got carried away, Nielsen? How about you? Uh, who, me? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think it would be better tonight. I think, by golly, I'd put my presents <laughs> under the tree first. You tell the men they can do anything they want to. Yeah, and you and the chief will be there, A right? typhoon couldn't keep us away. Here, Nelson, keys to the liquor stores, and don't be shy or you'll be spending the night running back after more. Uh, thank you, Captain. They won't be shy tonight. Oh, Nelson, keep the men out of sight for about 15 minutes, will you? Mr. Gallagher and I got some packages to get out there under that tree. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, by golly, this will be a good one. We were in the cabin with ten minutes to go before we met the crew at the tree. We changed to fresh jumpers and dungarees. Red was humming happily and even making a stab at shining his sea boots. We didn't hear it until Red stopped humming. Yeah, I hear it. What the devil? Let's quit kidding ourselves, Red. He's aboard. He's on deck. Come on. I'm sorry, Captain Connie. There was no place else to go. It was the Chinese girl, wet clothes clinging to her, her dripping child squirming angrily in her arms. Will you please help us? How'd you get here? To swim? There was no other way. I had to get Lynn away from him. Could you find something dry to wrap him in? Come on in? into the cabin. Take the kid, Red. Uh, me? Yeah, yeah, take him. Get that wet stuff off of him. Wrap a blanket or something around he's him. He's only angry and frightened. He'll stop crying when he's dry. I'm telling you, Skipper, this one does it. I'm finding a new bird. Here's a towel for you. Thank you. Uh, Captain, I, I didn't know where to turn. 
And after seeing the way you acted with my son on Major Osgood's ship, I knew he was lying when he told me you were trying to take Lynn away from me. Wait a minute. Yeah, that sounds a little phony to me, too. He told me to pretend that I didn't speak English so that you wouldn't try to talk to me. Why shouldn't we talk to you? Because he didn't want you to know the truth. I didn't know the truth until those two ships arrived today. Two Tibetan officials came on them, and after the Major told them about my son, I heard them bidding for him. And now I know that either one would kill him to keep the other one from getting him. You need a drink. No, I don't. You've got to believe me. My son was Lotus Born. Lotus Born? How's that work? He has a small birthmark on his back that is shaped exactly like a lotus blossom with seven petals. Red? Yeah, it's here all right, Skipper. Right between his shoulder blades. Okay, what's the rest of it? It makes of him a very special baby. Major Osgood told me that Lynn must go to Tibet to take the place of the 14th Sugai Lama who died during the same hour in which my son was born. If it were ordained, I was willing to give up my son. But I didn't know that he'd be bargained over as a political pawn by two power-crazy officials. Where was your son born? In San Francisco. Major Osgood's brother was the doctor who delivered him. Then while the Major kept us in hiding, he sent a man named Grimes to Tibet. It all sounded like the grand dreams that every mother has for her son. But now it's nothing. They'll kill him. I, I know they will. No, I don't think they will. I don't think they'll lay a finger on your son as long as he's on this ship. But they'll be here after him. If you knew what it meant to them, either one would have the power to rule the Buddhist world if he could take Lin with him. They'll do anything to get him. Now, look, there's a cabin right through that passageway. Small, but it's private. Now, here's some clothes about eight sizes too big for you, but they're dry. You'll feel better when you get into them. Now, go on. We'll take care of the kid. All right, Captain Cunn. Yeah. Well, how do you like this? Well, it's great. But we can't toss little Charlie here to the wolves, can we? No. Not till he gets some hair on his chest, anyway. And now look at him. The thankless little brat. He gets us into this mess, and now he goes to sleep. Red, I'll match you to see who goes forward to tell the crew. We'll huh? have to call out oh, the fire. No, no, I'm not matching, no. Captain. Oh, hold it, Red. Huh? Captain Tarnie, sir. Didn't take him long, did it? Go tell the story to the crew, Red. Bring two men back here wearing two automatics apiece, carrying rifles. Captain Tarnie, we're coming aboard. Well, the kid's asleep. Hide him a little better with that blanket before you go. I'll go out and match lies with the major. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Captain. <laughs> I, uh, I beg forgiveness for this rather brazen boarding of your vessel, I'll sir. put that in my log, Major. What do you want? Uh, first, uh, I would like to present to you my associate, Mr. William Grimes. Happy to meet you, Captain. How are you, Grimes? Uh, Captain, events have, a mere fraction of an hour ago, taken a distressing turn. Yeah, what happened? My charge is a comely Chinese girl and her infant son have disappeared, sir. Lock, stock, and barrel. Huh? Why'd you come here? Well, just on a chance first, Captain, but, uh, maybe we were right. You got the marks of wet feet on your deck here. I thought you have, sir. Leading directly to your cabin. Yeah, I just took a dip. Indeed, sir. Then have you heard or laid eyes upon this, uh, upon my disappearing passenger? In the first place, I haven't had time to look or listen. In the second place, I don't... Here. Well, now, there's a strangely familiar sound. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Captain, I suggest that we retire to your cabin where we may discuss this like gentlemen. Well, sir... Oh, I don't see why not. Come on. But you could forget any ideas you might have about taking the kid off this ship. He decided he didn't want to be a llama. Uh, you are aware of the startling truth. Then, sir, surely you jest when you intimate that he will be denied the honor, glory, and homage which are his just due. Oh, you. what are you handing me? Well, the find of the century, sir. It is destiny. Destiny that is rushing him headlong toward his rightful position as the 15th Sugai Lama. Who, sir? Who, I ask, would dare to stand in the way of destiny? Who, sir? I would, and take it easy with that desk. Yeah. You made him hysterical with your sacrilegious statement, Captain. Uh, Mr. Grimes, quiet the child. Stay away from him, Grimes. Listen, matey, you sold his mother this bilge up to a point. Bilge, indeed, sir. You've evidently sold your emissaries from the Orient on it. Maybe you've even sold yourself, but I don't buy so easily. And the mother lost interest when your two politicians started fighting over the kid like it was a pork barrel bill being shoved through Congress. That, I must say, is an odd reaction since she herself would be ennobled and held in the reverence due a queen. Not so odd when it looked like the bargaining would end with the kid being knocked off by one of your boys so the other one couldn't have him. Yes, you're the pessimistic one, Captain. 
I will admit that the emissaries coming from rival prelates did become somewhat feverish in their bargain. While we're on the subject of that bargaining, who was the highest bidder going to pay? Who was going to collect? Why, uh, it may surprise you to learn that I was. No, it doesn't. Why else would you bring two men from rival prelates to your little auction? The kid's staying on this ship and you're leaving. Not so Any fast, time. Carney. You are, of course, assuming that you have the right to interfere in a matter which is most definitely none of your affair. Yeah, since the boy was born in the States and this is an American ship. That enough, Major? Yes, you are a stickler, Captain. Yes, it's enough. I ask one small favor, Captain. More in desperation than in the hope of any show of generosity from you. It may indeed save my life as well as that of Mr. Grimes. What is it? I beg of you, sir, allow me to bring to this cabin my two erstwhile clients so that they may at least view the infant. If they do not see him, sir, their anger will no doubt reach extremes fatal to me as well as to my associate, Mr. Grimes. All right, Major, I'll give it a try. Thank you. But I'm going to have some armed crewmen in here. Uh, needless precaution, Captain. I assure you that our arrival will be in the spirit of the evening, sir. That of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. By the time he got back with them, we had the cabin ready for the audience. We had the child bedded down in my bunk with his mother sitting beside him and two crewmen heavy with weapons standing on each side of the cabin. The two Tibetans were draped in long robes and wore the black skull caps of their station. The first was thin, with an angular face and snapping black eyes. I would like to present Yafel Langdun, the emissary from Sugai, Captain Carney. It is with honor that I greet you, Captain. Welcome aboard. This, then, is the child. The second was older, heavier, with a set face that looked as though it had forgotten how to smile. I would like to present Rahima Kashgar, the emissary from Shigatsi, Captain Carney. I greet you from the heart, Captain. Welcome aboard. I would see the child without further waste of time. The two robed figures bent silently over the sleeping boy, moved him with gentle hands, lifted the blanket so that they could see the lotus mark on his back. They stood, still silent for almost a minute, then turned toward me. We would be honored to take the child now and make our decision as to which of us he will Wait serve. a minute. I thought you knew nobody's taking a child. What words are those? The boy belongs Major, to us? Major, I thought these men understood. I thought you told them no tell one... Tell them? Gad, Captain, what could I tell them save that you, sir, stand defiantly before them in the very act of kidnapping the child? What words are those? The Major took with his hands our payment. We will take the child by force he if we must. He goes with us to Tibet. We have fulfilled our bargain to you, I Major. I, too, have fulfilled my obligations. I have brought you to the child. From now on, gentlemen, your negotiations are with the captain. There yeah. aren't going to be any negotiations. I'm going to see that this kid and his mother get back to San Francisco. You will not be successful, Captain. We are well armed. We will not permit you to go until we have the child. We got more threats of armed boarding parties from the Tibetans as we helped them over the side. I pulled the crew the rest of the way out of their party mood, armed them. And in the faint light of the westing moon, we watched the Oriental crews join forces on the lugger. All in all, it was a great Christmas Eve. And the poor little guy who was causing it all slept peacefully through it on my bunk. Shoot. Well, what do we do? Just sit here? We can't sail out. They'll swarm all over us if we start to move. Mm. What a holiday. Oh, red. If we can hold out until the moon drops behind the ponds and we get some shadow out here, I'm going to try something anyway. Yeah, what? I think the way to spring this trap is through the Major. But i got to have something to bargain with. Red. If we can get our heaviest hawser around his anchor cable and secure it ashore, I think I'll have it. You think it can be done? Listen, I changed to baby tonight. After that, anything's a breeze. Forty minutes later, it was dark enough for us to go to work. With only a few yards between us and the lorry, I was able to make the whole swim underwater. But I found something better than the anchor cable to use. Groping down the curve of the lurie steel bow for depth, my hand hit a metal ring welded to the hull to be used for bracing and dry dock. I slipped my line through it, headed back toward the queen. Fifteen minutes later, Red had the other end of the horses secured, and the lurie was moored neatly to shore. I went into the cabin for dry clothes, jotted a radio message down on a blank, and rode over to the lurie. Grimes met me at the top of the ladder with a Thompson sub held ready at his hip and ushered me into the salon. Well, sir, a visit that I must confess is quite unexpected. Oh, it's the Christmas spirit, Major. Give and receive. I don't follow you, sir. You will. It's simple. 
I have you to thank for being bottled up. Now you have me to thank for the same thing. With me, it's the Tibetans. With you, it's a stout hawser from your ship's bottom to a palm tree ashore. Mr. Grimes, if you please, hand me your weapon. Go at once astern and test the captain's integrity. Don't take your eyes off him, Major. Never fear, I shan't. You are an extraordinary fellow, Captain. Go to such length. Oh, here. Here's a radio message I sent earlier tonight to the island officials on Fanning, a hundred or so miles north. You accused me of kidnapping the youngsters, so I've accused you of the same thing. Oh, yeah. This is Island Major Gregory Osgood and the Compass Grimes. Kidnapping to the United National Except the Rock Cave and Urgent Request and arresting us. Why, actually, Captain, this is no more than a sheet of fools, Cap. Am I to take your word that you made this, uh, No, no, you don't have to take my word. Why don't you wait for the patrol boat? It'll be in tomorrow. Yeah. Beastly situation. Yeah. What do you suggest, Major? Does it feel to you the ship's making sternway, Captain? I know it isn't. Yes, sir. Perhaps you have a suggestion as to how we might extricate ourselves from this deadlock. Have you now? Yeah. Give and receive. You call your Tibetans off the boy and me, and I'll call the arresting officers off of you. Uh, uh, discouraging thought, sir, since I would be forced to return to them the payment already received. You couldn't spend it in prison anyway. Now, that was unnecessarily cruel rejoinder, sir. Assuming that my actions were, as per your suggestion, how, then, would you proceed? Well, it's simple. Radio them that the first message was based upon faulty information. Tell them to ignore it. What would your story be? I presume that I would be forced to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. That actually, the boy is by no means metaphysically fitted to become the Sugai Lama. I figured as much. Yes, he was born at least four days before the Lama's death. Someone tampered with his birth records. <clears throat> uh, well, sir... Oh, Mr. Grimes. Oh, we're caught fast, all right, Major. The line must be fastened to our dry dock hook. It's too deep to reach. Uh, you've seen only one small portion of our dilemma, Mr. Grimes. Go fetch the chests we so recently received from the emissaries. For our very freedom, we are forced to return them. What? You mean you're going to give them back? Yes, in the ancient spirit of Christmas, to give is to receive. If you please, Mr. Grimes. It would be wise of you never to forget that. <laughs> He stopped at the Queen on his way back from his visit with the Tibetans, a sadly deflated major. His clothes torn, his face bruised, his hands raised pathetically. We told him we'd cast off the hawser and that the lorry was free to sneak away in the darkness. He climbed back to his small boat. Goodbye, gentlemen, and sad paradox. I feel driven to wish a Merry Christmas to you all. Same to you, Major. And many of them. <laughs> oh, Captain. Captain, could I have a word? Yeah, sure, you? Nelson. What is it? Well, Captain, it's 2 a.m., but, uh, but the men have been waiting, and uh, they wondered if it would be you all mean right. they but... want to have that party now, Nelson? Uh, yeah, that's right, Captain. They, they were awful disappointed. Well, turn them loose, Nelson. We missed Christmas Eve, but we got 22 hours yes. of Christmas Day ahead of us. Yes, sir. There's nothing like an early start. Well, we Captain. got that, no mistake. Let's <laughs> see what we can make of it. Hey! Hit the deck! Come on, every last one to study you! We got a celebration to take care of! And come out, sing him a carol, or you'll be home stone in the deck for the rest of the night! Come on, boys! What it proved, I guess, was that time is relative, and that Christmas is Christmas, even on Christmas Island. The Lurie and the other ships moved out. And the men were like kids again. Packages were ripped open, gifts compared. The cook spread, slightly stale from the long wait, was wolfed down. The bottles moved. The lagoon began to echo to the same carols that St. Mark's choir was singing. Ours weren't good, but they were loud. Brightly shone the moon that night, so the frost was growing. All but one of our number enjoyed them, and he was a loud minority. I wondered if he'd ever realize what this particular Christmas meant to him. But when I looked at his mother cradling him in her arms, I knew he would. The joy that shone from her face was different from ours. I couldn't help but think that her feelings must have been pretty much like those of the other mother. The way she held her tiny son and looked, not at us, not at our jury Christmas tree, not at the island of the sky, but beyond, 
into a clear but unknown future. Looking at her, I felt for just a moment that I really understood the holiday we were celebrating. for 24 hours after the party, during which a cutter arrived from Fanning Island to pick up Chi Niang Singh and her son and get them headed back toward the state. By three that afternoon, we nosed out through the reef and into the southeast trade. Stand by! Commit fire! The men moved to their station slowly, looking out over the stern at the island and remembering a laugh or a song and the meaning of good comradeship. With part, Pig! The block snapped taut. The reeds groaned under the halyards. The big mainsail bellied out in the breeze. The jib shot up. The mizzen swung into work. And the Scarlet Queen seemed to shake herself a little before she got balanced between wind and water, dropped her port rail, and settled down into her course. Then her rigging sang and her deck started to glisten with the spray she kicked into the wind that swept across her. That's a nice little breeze, Skipper. Are we getting all of it? Yeah, I don't think we're missing a whiff. You know, I've been feeling kind of ashamed, Skipper. About what, Red? About that Christmas party. Oh, it was great, and we all knocked ourselves out and got a lot of presents, but we didn't do one thing for our queen here. Oh, Red! No, no, not even a new pennant. Not one piece of new line. Oh, no. No. Uh, I'll bet you didn't even give her a thought. Well, blazes, I didn't. That's oh. why I don't feel guilty like you do. Oh, I don't know. You... Well, think it over. Well... All the things that happened aboard her. She was Christmas. Her whole work. How are you going to top that? Mm -hmm. Would a wassail do? <laughs> right. <laughs> a Christmas toast. <laughs> Here, Skipper. To the Queen? To the Scarlet Queen. After you, mate. <laughs> After you. Log entry. The catch, Scarlet Queen. 5.30 p.m. Wind fresh. Sky fair. Sea calm with long cross swell. Carrying full sail. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney. Master. The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Mm -hmm.